Well, especially if you had, you know, the power source in the Sun Temple, right? <clears throat> in the Sun Temple, archaeologists always associate the Sun Temples around the world with uh, places where the temple is aligned so that the sun hit at certain places, and that's all true. Uh, I, but clearly from Egyptian, from Maya, from Inca, you know, the sun was not just the sun in the sky. The sun gods had a power source that looked like a sun, a, a, a you know, plasma ball, an energy source that allowed them to move very large objects as we see all around these cultures and allowed them to like, um, you know, be able to build it like very, very large temples from rocks that come from very far, you know, on top of mountains and, and, and terraform the top of mountains. So this power source was typically called the sun disk. Mm. And um, so it wasn't necessarily the sun in the sky. And that's the thing. And that's why there's some confusion. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and you see it at the entrance of Egyptian temples as the sun disk, right? Or a sphere with wings. And the wings represent the fact that it can fly or that it, it's anti-gravitational. And when we look at some of the size of the massive stones just here in the terraces, and we'll see more of the megalithic design down there, I don't think we can rule out that they had some technology such as auditive levitation, that they had a way of moving these massive stones right. using levitation techniques that yeah. are still unknown to our scientific community. No doubt. No doubt, because you can see as well the way the placement of the stones and the way the stones are connected to each other, that it's not the result of tooling, it's not the result of somebody going at it with... Uh, with uh, brass or, or, or copper tools or even iron tools if they had them, which they didn't. Um, you know, you need something vastly more advanced. Even CNC cutting today wouldn't be able to do it. So we're talking of a technology that is unknown to us at this time in, in history. But we can now, with the level of technology and the level of, uh, of science we know of, we can start to speculate about the kind of technology and we're talking about you know cold plasma we're talking about you know the uh, energizing a stone to the point where it becomes soft that it becomes malleable and that it be and and that it overcomes gravitational forces so that it can be moved very easily placed and then kind of smooth it out into the position or into the shape you want it and then all the stones put around it kind of forms each stone as you make in the wall and when you look at these walls that's exactly <coughs> what you can see so and when you think about how an opera singer can shatter a wine glass with her voice mm -hmm. that auditive powers resonance can also affect matter right and perhaps the the cold plasma state it still had it to be move up here. It still was very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it was a combination of many ancient technologies which we're only rediscovering now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about high energy plasma physics. You have all kinds of, uh, they're called uh, um, uh, oscillation that can be even in the acoustic region, you know, in the plasma that can be that can be manipulated with acoustic uh, frequency and so on and and gravitational effects you know at, at very high frequency as well so like you have a whole band of spectrum of uh of resonance frequency to create the effect and then boom the 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 stone is soft and it's levitating and you can stick it wherever you want and and you can see that all around the world yeah. And it's just, it's just remarkable. This is such a great example because it's so remote. Mm. And the stones that make up these pre-cataclysmic wall, not the stones that were rebuilt by the Incas, but the, the stuff that was there before, they don't come from around here. Mm. They come from like way down the valley, you know, where, you know, there's no way they were brought here by people pulling on vine ropes and on rollers and stuff. And as we saw at Olite Tambo, the quarry was way up on the hilltop and there was no road even to take them down. Yeah, in some cases, the quarries are literally on the peak across the valley and, and it's just inconceivable that, and, and the stones were in the excess of 50 tons. 
right? So this non-trivial size and then perfectly fitted. So, you know, if they would have done a journey, I mean, some theory was that there was a ramp and they just rolled them down the mountain. It's like, well, if you did that, they wouldn't look that good by the time you're done with them. <laughs> so, um, you know, clearly there was completely different technique and a completely different level of technology, a technology that exceeds what we have today. And isn't it interesting that Brian was saying this is one of the densest concentration of megalithic buildings in the world. So clearly it would seem to me that there was some scientific community that knew how to do this and continued exactly. to build but different the, locations. Yeah, and, and, and it's not just the density of megalithic building and the precision and the amazing uh, structures that were made, but it's the terraforming of all of these valleys. Yeah. You know, you take millions, billions of people to terraform all these valleys and I'm not those are non-trivial numbers you know like billions of ton, tons of material because if you haven't been here you don't realize how much terraforming was done I mean you look down the valleys and as far as you can see like in the sacred valley it's terraformed everywhere and this in in the high altitude most of the stuff hasn't been renovated or like you know um, excavated so it's like it's it's insane like you don't do that for cultivation right. you you cultivate where it's easy and even today you know we cultivate in the valley we kind of cleaned up some of the little you know some of the the terraformed you know platforms here and there in the lower part but all the stuff in the altitude we leave it there because we don't have the technology to go and you know cultivate that high you know that's crazy uh, there's no reason right. uh, why would you need that much food right uh, and so on so but if you have gravity control if you have ships and you're trying to feed like a large population around the world right so imagine a culture pre cataclysmic culture 13,000 14,000 years ago with that had you know population all around the world they picked a beautiful valley terraformed it if you have gravity control it's no big deal terraformed it plant you know cultivate all around it and then export all around the world you know then that starts to make sense you know and that's how you start to see all kinds of cross-cultural similarity all around the world in the pre cataclysmic work mm. and if we're talking about advanced technology we could also work in cymatics and maybe they were working with the water to purify it and make the crops even grow more abundant. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's more than cymatics. It's, you know, I mean, and we have demonstrated this with this technology. We yeah. can grow things four times, 400% right. faster just by passing the water through resonating crystals. Right. Not just rock crystal, but crystal, technological crystal like these. And you know, and then you can grow crops that are remarkable with food that is remarkable. You can make seeds that are remarkable. And guess what? We find seeds that are thousands and thousands of years old from these ancient cultures that are still viable, right? They're remarkable seeds, and so on. So they, uh, they, there's definitely evidence that, and they, you know, and all the cultures they said when you meet the sun, if you meet the sun gods. You gotta go up to the top of the mountain, you gotta go through the path of initiation, and eventually you get to the top of the mountain and you get to the top temple, and that's when the sun gods come and meet with you, you know, coming from the ships. And there's so much evidence of that. And there's art, there's, there's, um, there's pieces of archaeology that are emerging from Mexico and many other places around the world actually depicting the ships meeting humans including Sumerian text and Sumerian plates that have been known to us all this time, but we've always interpreted this as mythology and, you know, nice stories that people made. Well, you know, these were very important stories but because they were conserved throughout all of history. So they weren't just like nice bedtime stories. And the initiation would be taking the Inca Trail for four days on one of the most grueling hikes you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And then coming here, just as Hiram Bingham did 107 years ago, one of the most recently discovered megalithic sites in the world. Mm -hmm. And putting in that physical exertion 
getting yourself to the point of exhaustion and then arriving at this. Mm -hmm. At this. Yeah. And imagine the inhale, you know, state that you would be in when you arrive here and you know, with the ships waiting for you to make the meeting. <laughs> Welcome home. Welcome home, folks. <laughs> okay, let's go and take a yeah. look around.